This video is going to cover the basics of energetics. You have seen some of this information from a eukaryotic perspective, probably in some of your other classes, but we are going to go into a bit more depth and look at what bacteria and archaea can do. And really, microbes can shine here because, as I've said before, microbial diversity is metabolic diversity. This is how microorganisms are very different from one another. Let's look at three examples. When you think of degradation and breaking down products, you think of generating energy, as you would, by degrading fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. That's the kind of nutrients you take in. Microbes can go far beyond the capabilities of humans. For example, atrazine, and the structure shown right here, is a herbicide used to control broadleaf weeds in corn, sugarcane, and even in people's lawns. You may know it as Roundup. And if it sits around, it's a problem. There's some evidence that it can be a serious problem for humans. Thankfully, there are some microbes that use atrazine, which is even more remarkable because it's a man-made compound that's only been around for a few decades. Here is the actual atrazine degradation pathway on the right. And on the left, you can actually see an organism that is capable of degrading atrazine. Microbes are also capable of growing only on iron. They will take reduced iron, iron 2 plus, dissolved in water, react it and oxidize it to iron 3 plus. Iron 3 plus will react with water and form iron hydroxide, which is an insoluble precipitate. Next time you go to a bog, go look at the water or a marsh and look at the water, the shallow water that's there, and you'll see that if there's any iron in the medium, in the water, you will see that a lot of it has precipitated out due to the action of these organisms. One example is Leptothrix discorphora. One final example is methanogens. There are even microbes that can use hydrogen and produce methane. These are the only known organisms that produce a hydrocarbon as an end product. This video lecture is going to begin to introduce you to the diversity of metabolism in bacteria and archaea. First, some definition. Metabolism is the sum total of all reactions that occur in a cell. And it consists of two types of processes, catabolism and anabolism. Catabolism is how complex molecules are broken down into smaller, simpler molecules with a release of energy and reducing power. And those are really important things that a cell uses. Please be aware that this definition may be simplistic because not all energy generating processes involve the breakdown of larger molecules. But we'll talk about this later as we go through different types of metabolism. Again, there's anabolism. Anabolism is the synthesis of complex molecules from simpler ones. This requires energy and often reducing power that you develop in catabolism. We will not cover anabolism here as it is a subject all on its own. If you are going to grow, you need energy. And energy is the ability to do work. It is possible to summarize metabolism with this simple figure. High energy electrons are taken from chemicals, shown here, and they are used to create chemical energy, here shown as ATP, and reducing power, here shown as NAD to NADPH. These are then used to power the necessary reactions of the cell. Photosynthetic organisms will take light, and they will use that to boost the energy of electrons, then go through processes that generate NADH and ATP. Keep this overview in mind as we go through the rest of metabolism. Let's start digging into the specifics. If we are going to talk about energy, an equation that you have to understand, and this comes from thermodynamics, which is physics, is Gibbs free energy. In this reaction, H, delta H, is the total energy of reaction. Delta T delta S or delta S is the amount of energy that is lost to disordering or entropy and is not available for work. Delta G is the amount of free energy available to do work. Now, lots of students have trouble 
understanding what S is, or entropy, or disordering. And a way to look at that is over here on the right side. If you take a container and you lock that container, and you put all the molecules on the left side, they're only going to be in left side. And then if you release that block, those random molecules bouncing around are going to be able to go wherever they want. This expansion and disordering in the system by these random molecules diffusing out beyond that border can be thought of as entropy. This is the amount of energy lost just in disordering in the system. Favorable reactions occur when delta G is negative. If you rearrange the equation, you can see that if a reaction increases the entropy of system, it will increase its favorability. So you see on here in the figure, the T delta S term is negative. So if you increase entropy, you're going to make delta G more negative. If something is broken into pieces, it becomes more disordered, as what happens in catabolism, those tend to be favorable reactions. A decrease in entropy, such as taking something and building it up, will result in an ordering of a system in a positive delta G. So in general, synthesis reactions cost energy and the cell has to do something to provide that energy. Equilibrium is important. The delta G of a reaction can also be represented by the following equation, where R is the gas constant, T is the temperature, and K equilibrium is the equilibrium constant of the reaction. So delta G equals delta G naught, which is the delta G at standard conditions, plus RT times the natural log of K equilibrium, where K equilibrium, it depends on the reaction. If you have an example reaction where A plus B goes to C plus D, K equilibrium equals the concentration of C times the concentration of D divided by the concentration of A times the concentration of B. Changing concentration is the deal here. If you increase A and B, what happens to the reaction? Well, first of all, A and B get larger, and the ratio for K equilibrium becomes much, much less than 1. Therefore, the natural log will be a negative number, and this will decrease delta G dot and make things more favorable. Now, if you increase C and D, what happens? In this case, K equilibrium will become larger than 1, RT natural log will become larger than 1, and that will decrease the favorability of a reaction. It will increase delta G. Delta G becomes less negative. So basically, changing the concentration of the substrates, A and B, or products, C and or D, affects the reaction. All right, so the result, having lots of substrate increases the rate of reaction going forward. Having low concentrations of products or removing the products increases the rate of the reaction going forward. Cells take advantage of this all the time. If they're trying to drive a reaction, they'll try and have a lot of the substrates around and they'll pull the products out of the, out of the way. Now, let's really pound this idea into the ground. Imagine that you have two substrates, A plus B, in this case pyruvate, and the other one coenzyme A. They're represented by a purple triangle and a yellow circle. They react to form acetyl coenzyme A, which is a green triangle and a green circle. Okay, so let's go to the reaction animation. So here's the reaction animation over here. If we start it, let's say it's labeled acetate, but just pretend it's pyruvate, because that's really what it should be. And let's say we start them out at very low concentrations. There's only five or six of each. Right? And we start the reaction. You can see them bouncing around here, and they don't come in contact with each other very often, and it's very unlikely they're going to cross paths, and even when they do, they might not react. And you don't see any product being formed because the concentration is just too low. Let's repeat this experiment, and now let's jack it way up. Let's put 50 of each in, and then run it again. Boom! Now we run it, we start with 50. Oh, we got a reaction already. 
we've got two reactions. We've got three, four, five, et cetera, et cetera. And as you can see, we get lots and lots of reactions going on, and it's proceeding much more quickly than when it was at a lower concentration. That gives you a mental picture of what this K equilibrium constant means and how it drives reactions forward and what it's actually describing. Another important concept is oxidation reduction reactions or redox reactions. Chemical energy is the potential of electrons. And if you think of a waterfall, items at the top of the falls have energy. And this energy can be released as they fall down the waterfall, shown in the middle puddle here. And then in the real water waterfall, this is released as heat and sound. But it can also generate mechanical energy if you capture this with a water wheel. Now at the atomic level, Electrons also have energy. An electron in an outer orbital has a potential energy. If it falls out of that orbital into a lower orbital, it, it can release some energy. And that released energy is available to do work. In the third panel, if energy is put into an electron in the form of heat or light, that can push that electron out and boost its energy. Now, secondly, if you're thinking about the transfer of energy from one atom to another, let's say from here to here, and we imagine this is our electron, that energy can transfer from one to the other, and if this is a higher energy orbital and this is a lower energy orbital, that energy transfer is actually favorable. And when that transfer happens, biological systems will take the extra energy available and use it to do work. Redox reactions occur all the time in the cell, and they involve the transfer of electrons from one compound to another. The electron donor, A in this case, that's reduced, in the transfer will transfer these two electrons, shown as purple, to B, and B that's oxidized becomes B that's reduced. The electron donor loses the electrons and becomes oxidized. The electron acceptor gains electrons and gets reduced. Here's an example of a redox reaction you are probably familiar with the burning of natural gas, which is methane for the most part. Methane is the reduced agent or the reducing agent. Oxygen is the oxidizing agent. These two react and form carbon dioxide. Electrons are transferred from the carbon to the oxygen, forming CO2 and water. So you're actually donating these electrons from one, one item to another, and this methane becomes oxidized, the O2 becomes reduced, and you make carbon dioxide and water. In the cell, a reduced compound transfers its electrons to an oxidized compound, and in this transfer, releases energy in some form. So here it is again, that energy being transferred from one to another. A reduced is the energy source. But to actually have this reaction take place and go from A to B, B also has to be present. Chemicals vary in their tendency to donate or accept electrons, and this can be measured. They are typically expressed as half reactions. And the tendency of something to release its electrons is called its reduction potential. Many reactions have been characterized, and by convention, redox reactions are written as a reduction. These are compared against the standard reaction, and you can then place them in a table of reduction potentials, and that's what's actually shown on here. For example, here is the reduction of hydrogen protons to hydrogen gas, and that has a redox potential of negative 420. This does not like to accept electrons. It likes to give them. On the other hand, oxygen here at the bottom, you give it four hydrogen and four electrons, it'll make two waters. This is a reduction potential of 815. That is a very favorable reaction. And these are all measured versus a standard reduction. For the cell, you want to maximize the spread between your electron donor and acceptor. Good electron donors have high energy electrons and will release them to good electron acceptors, shown here at the bottom. 
a large amount of free energy can be released from these reactions and you can even calculate it using the formula here shown at the bottom. Delta G is equal to N times F delta E where delta E is the electron drop in volts between the two and then F is the Faraday constant. An energy yielding redox reaction occurs when the electrons travel from A to B and then energy is released and captured by the cell and the amount of energy or released and captured is N times the Faraday constant times electron potential job drop and the maximum it can be is delta G and it just depends how much the cell captures. In most cases electron transfer is not direct. You go through electron carriers in the cell as shown here. So we have this reduced A, it gets electrons to the electron carrier, it then transfers them to B. Typical electron carriers are small molecules like NADH and quinones or proteins such as cytochromes or flavor protein. As an example, here is the structure of NAD, which is a very common electron carrier in the cell. The oxidized form is shown here on the left. If you add protons and a proton and two electrons, you get the reduced form here on the right. And you can see that this carbon was reduced and this nitrogen was reduced. And that's where it carries the electrons. In the cell, this is kind of more what happens. You have enzyme one here. NAD binds to the site along with the electron donor. They associate with the enzyme. The enzyme facilitates the transfer of electron to NADH. You now have a reduced NADH. The NADH in the pool can then bind to the enzyme 2 that needs electron to, to drive a reaction and put it on an electron acceptor. These two bind. The NADH is transferred to the electron acceptor and then they're both released and the electron acceptor is now reduced. The cell also needs to store chemical energy and this is often kept as a phosphate bond. These phosphate bonds have a significant amount of energy and that energy can then be used to drive reactions by hydrolyzing ATP. So here's the structure of adenosine diphosphate. Right, here's the adenosine, a ribose sugar. It then has two phosphates on it. You add an extra phosphate, you make adenosine triphosphate. And this is a very common molecule to use to hydrolyze it and in the case then drive reactions forward. What it does is ATP is storing chemical energy. So you get energy from catabolism, which is exergonic energy releasing processes. It transfers this energy to ATP. When ATP is hydrolyzed, you, can re you release that energy, and that energy can then be used to perform work. While ATP is the most common chemical energy currency, it is not the only way of storing energy. There are several other chemicals in the cell that store energy. For example, PEP, glucose 6-phosphate, acetyl phosphate, and coenzyme A. And you can see over here the amount of energy that can be released by the hydrolysis of the phosphates that's bound to them. Okay, so here's the take-home messages from this introduction to basic energy concepts. Number one, cells run chemical reactions to generate free energy. Number two, cells harness this free energy to create order, build things, which costs energy. Number three, equilibrium is important. And the cell uses that all the time to drive reactions forward. And we'll talk about examples of that when we go through the other lectures in metabolism. Four, redox reactions occur all the time in the cell and they are used to store energy in the form of electron carriers and chemical energy is often stored as phosphate bonds. All right, see you in class.